In this video, we are going to be learning about electric fields and electric forces. Electric fields are caused by electric charges. When we symbolize electric charge, we'll give it the symbol Q, capital or lowercase. Charge is the property of some particles, not all, that causes it to exert a force on other charges. This force we're going to call the electric force. Um, it's a fundamental property, meaning we can't really define it in terms of anything that's simpler. A better way to understand it would be in an analogy. Charge causes the electric force the same way that mass, namely gravitational mass, causes the gravitational force. And so you can think of charge as being the electrical equivalent of mass. It's the thing, the property, that causes an electric field and therefore an electric force. We know that there are two kinds of charge, which, we're ha which we have named positive and negative. These names are actually picked by a guy by the name of Benjamin Franklin long ago. Today, we know that protons, a particle in the nucleus of an atom, has a positive charge, and electrons, which are outside the nucleus of an atom, have a negative charge. This is very recent that we know this, like in the 20th century. And so when Benjamin Franklin named the charges, he just knew that they were opposites of each other. He didn't know what particle carried what kind of a charge. We know that like charges will exert a repulsive force on each other. That means that they'll push apart. And opposite charges will attract each other, meaning they'll pull together. And so if you have two oppositely charged particles, they'll exert an attractive electric force whereas two like-charged particles will exert a repellent force. And so two positive charges will repel, two negative charges will repel. Charge is conserved, which means that the net or total charge of a closed system remains constant. Closed system means that nothing from the outside interferes. Nothing extra comes in and nothing from the system can leave. We can create charge, but we can't create an imbalance of charge. Charges can be transferred between two objects. For instance, rubbing a balloon on wool creates an imbalance of charge by transferring charge from one to the other. When an object is charged with a D at the end of it, that means that it has an imbalance of charge. All objects have some charge because all objects are made out of protons and electrons because all objects, all objects are made out of atoms. And so if an object has an imbalance of charge, meaning more of one than the other, we say it is charged. A neutral object would look like this. Same number of positive and negative charges. This object would be negatively charged. A positively charged object would have more positive charges than negative. And so not all objects are charged. In fact, most objects are neutral. Charged means that we have an imbalance, one, more of one than the other. A conductor is an object which allows charges to move throughout them. Metals are good conductors. Insulators are the opposite, do not allow charges to move through them. Um, so again, metals are good conductors. Good insulators are things like rubbers and plastics. And that's why we wrap wires with rubber, so that the charges don't move through the rubber. So here's an example of the kind of thing we need to understand about charges. Suppose we have a charged balloon, and we bring it close to a metal sphere. Here's the metal sphere just on its own. Equal number of positive and negative charges evenly distributed throughout the sphere. Now remember, because the sphere is made out of metal, then the charges are allowed to move within it. So when we bring that negatively charged balloon close, the negative charges will move to the opposite side, far away from the balloon. The positive charges will move towards the other side. This is referred to as induction. We have inducted, a sep or induced rather, a separation of charge. If we were to somehow cut 
the sphere in half, then we would have two half spheres, one which is positively charged, one which is negatively charged. When we need to measure an electric charge, the unit that we're going to use is the Coulomb, named after a French guy named Coulomb. The symbol for a Coulomb is a capital C. In chemistry and phys or excuse me, in chemistry, you said that the charge on an electron or proton was plus or minus one. That's kind of just a unitless counting system. In physics, we need to use the unit of coulombs so that our forces come out to be in newtons. The charge on a proton or an electron, which we're going to refer to as the elementary charge, Q subscript E, is the smallest possible value of charge that you can have. So if you have one proton, then its charge is the smallest possible charge you can have because you can't divide a proton into anything smaller. The value of the elementary charge in coulombs is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Very, very small number. Protons and electrons are really, really small. Since protons and electrons cannot be divided, you can't have any value of charge that is not a whole number multiple of the elementary charge. So for instance, you can't have four and a half protons, so you can't have a charge that is four and a half times the elementary charge. So for example, you can have a charge of 3.2 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. That would just be two times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, or two protons. You can have a value of 4.8 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. That would be three protons. But you cannot have a value of 4 times 10 to the negative 19. That would be like two and a half protons, and you can't have two and a half protons. The same way you can't have two and a half people. Try to divide it, it ceases being a proton. This guy, Coulomb, who the unit for charge is named after, came up with a relationship between the force exerted on a charge and the value of its charge and the distance between the charges. Um, he hypothesized that the electric force would follow the same kind of rule, same kind of law, as gravitation, which we learned about previously. Namely, that it depends on the distance between the charges squared or what we would call an inverse square law. So in the electric force equation, the distance between the two charges squared would appear on bottom. The two charges themselves would appear on top. The bigger the charge is, the bigger the force. And then so that our, un or so that our answer comes out to be in newtons, we need to introduce some sort of constant. A constant we're going to induce is K, referred to as the charge constant. And it has a value of 9 times 10 to the 9th newtons time meter squared per coulomb squared. We use Coulomb's law to figure out the magnitude of an electric force. It doesn't tell us anything about the direction. We use the rule that opposites attract and likes repel to figure out what the direction of the charges are. So by knowing what kind of charge we have, we can determine the direction. We would not put in plus or minus signs into Coulomb's law. So as a simple example, suppose we were asked to find the electric force on one of these two charges. In this case, we'll look at the one on the right. So we've got two charges. Both are negative. One is negative 3 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. The second is negative 9 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs and they're 0.2 meters apart. And so using Coulomb's law, we're only going to substitute in the size of the charge, not the sign. And so that will look like this. Plug in K, plug in Q's, and then R. Don't forget to square the R. When we do that arithmetic, we get something like 608. Canceling out the units leaves us with Newtons. That doesn't tell us what direction the force is. To figure out the direction of the force, we need to consider the actual kind of charge that we have. 
since these are two like charges, they're going to repel each other. And so my total answer, all my answer, would be 680 newtons to the right for the blue charge up there. This concludes our lesson on electric forces.